All right, there we go. Hello, everyone. How's it going? Team here, and this is BXJS Weekly episode number 50. I honestly have uh, no idea what to do. Uh, I mean, <laughs> uh, that's not what I wanted to say. I want to say that this is um, sort of a milestone for me and, you know, for all of you guys supporting me. So thank you very much for your support. And I'm basically looking forward to the next 50 episodes so that we can do something fun at episode 100. I honestly couldn't come up with anything fun to do for this one. So if you have any ideas, um, do feel free to share with me and maybe we'll just do it after the episode during the next week. Um, hello, Bakao. Welcome to the stream. Hey, Mandaputra. Welcome to the stream. So we got some stuff today. Let's get started. Uh, the first article we got here is from the Google web team. It is called rendering on the web. And it essentially explains you all the related um, terminology related to the rendering and well, all the performance talks specific to the web apps rendering like server side rendering, client side rendering, let me try that again. Rehydration, pre-rendering, time to first byte, first paint, first contentful paint, and time to interactive, which is basically what you typically see uh, people using in the articles where they discuss the performance and sort of the types of rendering of the modern progressive web apps and JavaScript apps, right? So if you already know all of those terms, if you already know what the server-side rendering are, what the rehydration is, what is time to interactive is, and so on and so forth, you won't really find anything new here. If you are not familiar with some of those terms, if you are still don't understand some of those completely, then do make sure to read this article. It explains just about everything you gotta know in a very good manner. So yes, quite highly recommended as usual. Those guys produce incredible articles. I would also recommend to look at basically everything else they have here because all of that is essentially good. So there you go. Next article we got here is building a modern carousel with CSS scroll snap, smooth scrolling and pinch zoom. This is an article that looks like um, or basically essentially at but God damn it, I am terrible at this today. So this article looks at how you can build a image carousel using pure CSS and JavaScript, like a tiny bit of JavaScript. So essentially the very basic features without having any third party library that would need, uh, you know, kilobytes of space essentially. So um, it's pretty cool. There's, it turns out there is a lot of CSS and JavaScript features right now that allow you to quite easily build this uh, sort of uh, carousel library that works uh, equally well on mobile, on browser, and even with like accessibility features, which is really neat. Uh, now there are still some edge cases, like for example, iOS Safari as usual doesn't support um, some features, so you have to do like back polyfilling it with uh, you know prefixing CSS features with flags and stuff like this which can be a bit annoying. But nonetheless, you know, looking at this, uh, it is very impressive that in 2019, we can finally do that without relying on third party libraries that essentially polyfill missing features, which is kind of awesome. So if you're curious how you can build an accessible modern carousel in CSS and just a tiny bit of JavaScript, make sure to check this article out. It has um, an overview of some really neat features essentially. Hey, Strax, welcome to the stream. All right, continuing, we got announcing open web components. So um, this is an announcement of OpenVC um, thing collective. I, I'm not sure how to call it. It's, it's sort of a group of people as well as bunch of libraries that aim to simplify the web components development and make it more accessible, more approachable and easier to do essentially. This is what they do and the article explains exactly what are they delivering as the sort of first version, including, you know, testing utilities and that's like a bunch of everything, including start your app and whatever, which looks by the way, quite nice and also has the perfect or well, near perfect hundred score in Lighthouse, which is also impressive. So if you're curious about web components, but uh, thought they might be a bit hard to do, make sure to check OpenVC because they are actually, they have some really good tooling. So yeah, do, sh do be sure to check this out. Right, next thing we got here is using TypeScript with React. This is a pretty basic tutorial telling you how to set up React with TypeScript development using parcel bundler. So if you already have experience with TypeScript with parcel and with React, you won't really find anything new here. 
If you are just getting into TypeScript and want to know how to use it, if you never heard of Parcel, do make sure to check it out. It's a pretty good tutorial. Nothing really eye opening here, but it will get you started uh, with TypeScript and React in about five minutes. It's not very large, not very complex, uh, but it is quite good to essentially getting started with it. All right. Next thing we got here is this uh, answer from Dan Abramov to the article called React Hooks Slower Than Higher Order Components. And the Dan goes to basically criticize the article. Um, the title of this response is essentially this benchmark is indeed flawed. And then Dan goes into details telling uh, the author how exactly the benchmark is flawed and what are the problems with it and how you could make it better. Now, here's the thing. The, it's, it's absolutely interesting to read this and to see the points uh, that essentially Dan brings up, which make total sense once you start reading about them. But when you read the original article, it's sort of, you look at it and go like, okay, that's, that seems, um, this seems to make sense, right? And then you start reading the Dan's answer and you go like, okay, that makes even more sense. And the gist of it is essentially benchmarking is hard. So it's actually very, very hard to benchmark the correct things and benchmark them correctly. Nonetheless, if you have any interest in, um, you know, benchmarking, I would say, so it doesn't really, the comparing hooks versus higher order components doesn't actually, I mean, there's not much difference. Like it's like within the, within reasonable boundaries, let's just put it this way. So, but the, out, the outlook on this, you know, the benchmark is what really interesting here. So make sure to check this out if you have any interest in benchmarking at all. Hey, Samal Havitz, welcome to the stream. Right, continuing, we got performance versus readability, specifically with relation to the JavaScript. So the article talks about the, um, you know, we have this one solution, uh, sorry, one problem and two different solutions. So there is a way to process numbers that you can either do in a simple map and sort functions, right? So this is, this is what you typically write. This is what, what I typically write. It's very simple, it's three lines of code essentially. And then you can do exactly the same thing by using for while and returning a new array, an array slice as well for duplication, right? And uh, the author goes here and compares those two approaches, right? So essentially one of them is, is basically one liner where you just map numbers and then sort them. And the other one is this very, very complicated thing using slice, using for loop, using while loop, and it is crazy. And the thing is that this complex solution, it actually is way, way more performant. It performs, I don't know, what is it? Four or five times better than the map sort solution, simply because it is, I mean, you know, it's, it's, what's the, it's built with the JavaScript engines in mind. So the JavaScript engine, when it sees a beard of code, it can actually optimize it, right? While the map and sort thing is built with the humans in mind, because when the human sees it, you can immediately, like when you see this, you can immediately say what this bit of code does, right? While you see this, it will take you probably a good 10 minutes to figure out what the hell is happening here. And this is exactly the point, right? So there is a lot of other examples in this article comparing, for example, spread syntax with object assign. Uh, I will note that some of those comparisons and performance are actually a bit outdated. So there's like the Chrome 68, for example, here, and I believe it was Chrome 72, which had uh, V8 7.2, which was, uh, which had uh, some significant optimizations for spread, which is now near the same performance as object assigned, for example. So this doesn't really hold here, but nonetheless, you know, the argument is still the same while, um, majority of time you should just write code that is readable for humans and then only think about optimizations when you hit the problems, right? So when you finally get to that moment, when you see that your code is underperforming or causing some bottlenecks or whatever, then you should start thinking, okay, so how can I rewrite this tiny bit of code to make it more efficient? Do I even have to do this? Maybe there's other way to optimize it. Maybe I just need more optimal data structure, which actually solves majority of problems to be honest, but uh, there you go. So if you're curious on this whole topic of readability versus performance, and if you're curious to see how uh, well, let's just put it this way, uh, V8 6.8, because the majority of tests seems to be done in net. would actually be curious to see uh, how that behaves in the modern browsers uh, and how much the difference would that make. Uh, yeah, so if you're curious, just check it out. It's a pretty good article. Uh, so Kevin, hello, welcome to the stream. 
Right, continuing, we got React hooks in TypeScript. This is a tutorial showing you how to type your hooks, new React hooks using TypeScript, right? So I am, as you might know, not using TypeScript at all. So I can't really comment on any of that, but it looks like it basically gives you a very good introduction to how to properly type your hooks and how to use them with TypeScript so that it doesn't complain about um, vague types essentially, right? So make sure to check this out if you're using TypeScript and writing hooks or planning to write them. It seems to be quite good. Next article we got here is replacing a hot path in your apps JavaScript with WebAssembly. There is actually two parts of this article and I forgot to open the second one. Let me do that in a second. There we go. So we got, uh, whoops, that is not what I wanted to do. God damn it, come here. There we go. So um, there is the article itself, which is from the Google Web team that talks about uh, replacing this uh, hot path for the images, which is essentially um, swapping uh, pixels or rotating pixels, images, uh, sorry, God damn, let me try. <laughs> let me try to formulate that again. So they have the image. Uh, this is the Squoosh app that we're talking about. The image is the worst case, I believe 4,094 by 4,096 pixels. And you need to take this mat matrix of pixels and rotate it 90 degrees, right? It's a very complex operation and they've written a basic JavaScript code here that takes a bit under two seconds to complete, which is actually quite reasonable. The problem is there is a bunch of different JavaScript engines and sometimes it takes over eight seconds on a specific browsers. They don't name browsers here, I guess for the reasons, you know, of the solidarity with other vendors because they make sense. So they set out to solve it by using WebAssembly, which is low level code and will be executed the same way in all the browsers, right? So they, um, they actually wrote the same algorithm in different uh, languages that compile to WebAssembly, starting with a CNM scripton, going to Rust and going to assembly script, and then comparing all of that um, to see the sizes and performance differences, which is actually quite interesting. There is difference between the WebAssembly execution speed and execution sizes, depending on what you use as a source language, which is kind of interesting. <laughs> so. There you go. Uh, now here's the interesting bit. While all of this is really cool and fascinating to read, there is absolutely awesome discussion and hacker news related to this article where the top comment, uh, actually the author here managed to write a for loop in JavaScript that is faster than the stuff that the um, authors wrote in WebAssembly, which is absolutely fascinating. So the author here used the technique called loop tiling, which essentially, um, there is an explanation here somewhere. Um, yeah, da, 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 da. yeah, so it's faster because it is a working set of 64 by 64 by four by two bytes that can almost fit into CPU core L1 cache, which is fascinating that you can actually do that. I haven't even thought about that. You know, I, I didn't, I'm not really in the area of heavily optimizing code to be very efficient to this extent. It's like, so this, the, the tiling loop um, approach actually manages to execute this large loop in 0 0.07 seconds, which is insane. Again, it's faster than WebAssembly. So if you are, if you have the slightest interest in code optimizations and, you know, figuring out the WebAssembly and other ways to improve your code, do make sure to read the article and do make sure to read the comments on Hacker News because some of those are absolute goals. Like this is just really, really cool. All right, continuing, we got DOM performance case study. There is a lot of performance article this time around and this one talks about various techniques that you can use to improve your performance while working with the DOM directly. So, you know, the, art, the author actually starts out by saying, hey, when was the last time you actually interacted with the DOM directly, which probably, I mean, at least for me, you know, it was ages ago when I built a tiny demo that just rendered something to the DOM, but majority of time we are indeed using libraries and UI frameworks like React, Vue, D3.js or whatever, right? But sometimes you do have to do it yourself and it's good to remember about those techniques that allow you to make it more efficient like reflows and batching and uh, other tinier optimizations including CSS optimizations using animations uh, from CSS and so on and so forth. So if you are unfamiliar, I guess, with some of the DOM techniques like batching, for example, this is one uh, non-obvious one 
the idea that you can create document fragment, actually write to it and then write the document fragment to body. And this is actually when the DOM update will happen, right? Everything else will be in memory. So if you're unfamiliar with this, make sure to check out this article. There are some pretty good pointers in here and some good uh, discussion as well at the end of it. If you already know all of that, well, then you won't really find anything new here. Continuing, we got instrumenting HTTP requests in Node.js. So this is article talking about the code instrumentation. I think the code instrumentation area in general is a very interesting one. I personally never had to work with that, but I find it absolutely fascinating to read about it. So in this specific case, the author talks about instrumenting HTTP requests to track the performance of your web app, right? Because HTTP request is not just fetch call, the what happens in the background is actually way more complex, right? So you get the in node, you get the client that opens the socket to the agent, the agent then talks to kernel, the kernel then does something returns you the socket, you then use the socket to connect to the server and so on and so forth. There is like a ton of things happening in the background, right? So in some cases, you might actually want to monitor that to track the performance of your app to track, for example, how many requests was faulty, how many requests was timed out, for example, or what kind of uh, average time per request is there? What is what are what kind of outliers do you have maybe cache the errors this way. And this is exactly what this code shows you how to do how to instrument the requests in node specifically because it uses the uh, HTTP package in node. So this won't work in the browsers, obviously, uh, to instrument the HTTP request and see what exactly happens and even set up like, you know, some timeouts and stuff like this for your specific request. So if you have any interest in that, do check it out. This is a really good one. Next article we got here is another one from the Google Web Developers team, and it's called Resource Prioritization, Getting the Browser to Help You. And it essentially talks about the various means that the browsers provide to prioritize uh, resources in HTML and help you manage them and load them more efficiently. Right. So it talks about uh, things like the uh, prefetching priority, uh, preloading, prefetching, uh, what was there, preconnecting and stuff like this. Yes, that's like, a, I think there's four or five different fields that you can add to your resources that behave different, slightly differently and lead to a different performance changes in your perceived performance. Right. So if you are again working in this field where you have to have a web app that performs really well, do check it out. There is some really good explanations. Right. Next thing we got here is experimenting with Bluetooth in JavaScript apps on the web in hybrid apps and react native. So this is essentially, um, I mean, I guess you could call it test case slash tutorial that looks on how you can use Bluetooth API in three different environments starting. Uh, so they, they actually, <laughs> This is my favorite part of the article. So they work with a device called Nordic Thingy 52. I, I'm just, I absolutely love that someone called their device Thingy. And that's literally the name of the device, right? So this is, this is our Thingy here. <laughs> this is great. So they, they basically, the author here sets up the communication to this uh, Thingy, which provides the environment and motion sensors, the temperature, humidity, pressure, air quality, accelerometer, gyroscope, and compass, and exposes them over Bluetooth. So the author writes the code that allows them to access all those uh, sensors first using web Bluetooth, which is actually seems to be quite mature already. And it's really cool that you can basically write this in JavaScript and just access all of that from the browser. You can even specifically target one device as shown here in the code of snippets. So they only connect to this specific Bluetooth device of obviously you have to know the UUID of device, but hey, that's uh, not a big problem. And uh, then they do the same using the hybrid app, which essentially exposes the um, the Cordova uh, plugin in this case. I mean, again, not very hard to do. And then they use the React Native, uh, which also has the Bluetooth uh, plugin, which also is very easy and actually very close to the um, native web API for Bluetooth, which is kind of cool. So if you have any interest in working with Bluetooth in JavaScript, do check it out. This is a pretty good tutorial and also a very good uh, sort of test case, I guess. Continuing, we got simulating blobs of fluid in JavaScript and exactly the stuff that you see in the background right now, if you're watching the video is what you are going to be implementing. This uses 3GS and some simulated physics and it is pretty damn complicated, to be honest. 
But if you ever wanted to work with uh, sort of fluids, 3JS and physics simulation, I would definitely recommend checking this out because it's a very, very detailed write-up on how to build something like this. And it is really, really fascinating. So yeah, if you have any interest in uh, 3JS graphics and simulations, do check it out. This is all shaders, I believe. So um, again, you know, this is completely out of my area of expertise. So I have, I know nothing about that, but it was interesting to read anyway. And it also reacts to your scrolling, by the way, which is kind of neat. <laughs> there you go. All right, next article we got here is the new React lifecycle methods in plain approachable language. Um, it is, I'm, I mean, it's, <laughs> It's kind of weird because this is a really good and really detailed article on React's lifecycle methods. As you can see here, it is a very long one and it talks about, well, just about all the lifecycle methods you have, but it talks about them uh, from the React component classes. So this actually does not contain any lifecycle methods from the hooks side, which I imagine is what we're going to be what majority of people are going to be using in the nearest future. While all of those methods that still happen with hooks components as well, it's just you use them slightly differently, right? So I would say basically, if you still don't understand some of the React lifecycle methods, or you want to learn about them more in depth, then I would highly recommend reading this article. If you already know all of them, if you already understand how mounting, updating, unmounting, error handling, and all that kind of stuff works, you won't really find anything new here. It's basically just very in-depth look into all the uh, lifecycle methods, including, you know, constructing, rendering, shoot component, update, blah, blah. And yeah, error handling. Um, no hooks, as I said. Uh, although, you know, if you understand these methods, translating them to hooks won't take uh, that much effort. But yeah, still very solid article, quite highly recommended. Next article we got here is, yes, from me. I got a shameless plug for you. Uh, shameless plug for you is what I wanted to say. This article is called Outstated, Simple Hooks Based State Management for React. So um, hooks are now out. And uh, before the hooks were out, we had this really nice uh, library called Unstated, which was absolutely joy to use. It used higher order component and render props uh, to basically pass the state to anywhere. And it was really cool because it was it's super tiny, super easy to use and uses the same API as any React component like this set state basically, right? The problem is it doesn't work that well with hooks. So I've written a new library that is called Outstated that essentially allows you to build your store as a hook, which is this, this store is literally a React hook. So it, you can just use it as a hook anywhere. Now, the problem with this is that if you use this store as a hook straight up in like two components, it's gonna be two different stores, right? So they won't share state. Now, Outstated essentially introduces you a way to share the state for the same store across a bunch of components. The way it works is very simple. You wrap your app in the provider that has the list of stores. So it can be one, it can be two, it can be any number essentially, right? So the, uh, the task of the provider is to initialize each of those stores because as I discovered, you cannot actually do this dynamically. So I first tried to get rid of this provider and just allow you to initialize the hook using this use store. But um, the problem is that React expects to have the same number of hooks on every re-render. So if you say render the first time, there is no hook, you call it, you initialize it, right? Then the data updates, you re-render, but you already have this hook initialized, so you reuse it, right? This won't work because your hook numbers just changed, so React will complain. So what the outstated does, it basically initializes the hooks in the provider one time, and then every time you call use store, it will just fetch the hook by the constructor ID, so it's using the uh, map for that, and just use that hook locally, which means that the hook will be shared across a bunch of components, and then you can just reuse it anywhere you want, which which is great because it means that you can um, use any other hooks within this, your store, right? So you can just take any other existing React hook and use it in here and it will work as expected. Um, the cool thing is um, the whole library is just 474 bytes minj zipped and the whole source code is literally, um, I think it was like 50 lines, yeah, 49 lines, Oh no, wait, 40 lines, including a bunch of comments explaining why this happens. Hooks are absolutely fascinating. So if you're working with React and if you don't want to drag the whole Redux to you, check out Outstated. I am pretty happy how it turned out. It is very easy to use and 
Essentially, you don't like I like Outstadia doesn't even manage state for you. React does that, which is the best part of it, I think. So there you go. All right. Continuing, we got ad blockers performance study, which is really really interesting article that talks. Um, so this is a result. Um, I guess motivated as, as the authors say, the study is motivated by the recent manifest with three controversy, which is the idea that the you know Chrome will change the manifest with three and remove the way that the all the ad blockers work currently and only allow doing this web request API. And um, the main point, the main justification for this change was performance, right? So there's the ad blockers are slow. So the authors here set out to prove that is actually in fact not true. And they compared the performance of uBlock Engine, AdBlock Plus, Brave, DuckDuckGo, and ClickZ Gostry uh, ad blockers and request blockers. But they don't compare the whole uh, packages as in they don't look as you know how much faster the web is or whatever because this is not what the extensions API uh, discussion was about, right? They actually focus on network request blocking engines. So they compare how much of impact does those extensions have on request, network requests. And uh, there is one caveat, which I think that sort of kind of doesn't actually make the uBlock origin comparison fair, because one of the key things of uBlock Origin is that they use the WebAssembly version of Blocking Engine, which is way faster than basically everything out there. And in this case, they are, were running the uh, benchmarks in Node.js and for some reason could not use a WebAssembly engine of uBlock Origin, which makes it way slower, right? So the uBlock Origin uh, like loses in some cases here. It's still the fastest one out there, which is impressive, but it could be even faster, which is absolutely insane. So uh, still, there is the results. Uh, they measured the time to process a request. Uh, the ghost tree is the fastest one, obviously, because it like likely, I'm, I'm actually not sure why it is the fastest one. Maybe because Gostry doesn't really care much about all the requests because it's a very simple extension in comparison to, you know, uBlock or AdBlock, for example. And yeah, it's, I guess this is, this explains why Gostry would be the smallest and fastest and have the tiniest memory impact. Um, but uBlock Origin is again, impressively fast. Um, and uh, yeah, there is there's like a detailed explanation of how exactly they measured everything, what kind of impact uh, all those engines, um, all the extensions had on requests. As you can see here in majority of time, the impact is sub uh, 0 0.1 millisecond. Like the worst case, DuckDuckGo extension has a 12 millisecond, millisecond, 12 milliseconds impact, which is okay, this is maybe kind of noticeable. But then again, if you take something like AdBlock Plus or uBlock Origin, which is the most popular ones, you get 0 0.1 millisecond, which is nothing. <laughs> like nobody will ever notice any of that, right? Even if you have like hundreds of requests per page, this is unnoticeable. So yeah, and there's, there's more data. There's some nice charts. It's a very, very scientific uh, article. I would even go as far as to say that I would not be surprised to see something like this published as a proper scientific paper. <laughs> But uh, yeah, the data is published, the benchmarks are published. So if you wanna, you can try it on, on your own. Uh, really good data, really good write-up. Um, again, I'm a bit sad that they weren't able to test WebAssembly performance of uBlock Origin, but then again, it is still very impressive. So yeah, this, I, like again, this is just another pointer that manifest with three changes are just straight up stupid and are not helpful to consumers. So there you go. Quite cool, so if you are interested in extension API changes and performance impact, do check it out, it is very fascinating. All right, last thing we got in articles here today is funding ESLint's future. And this is um, essentially an um, article calling for everyone who has an opportunity to fund ESLint. So if you are working for a company that uses ESLint, and let's be honest, if you're using JavaScript, you're likely using it, and you have an option, an opportunity to give them money, please do so. They already managed to um, score the Facebook and Airbnb as sponsors, as well as front-end masters who are bringing a smaller ver um, option, like donation that they did. But if you are working for a company that can contribute to open source monetarily, please consider doing that because this is like, come on, ASLint is a tool that everyone uses. 
we need that and they need uh, 20,000 per month uh, to make this sustainable for the foreseeable future, which I think considering the number of the companies who work with ESLIN should be doable for them. I at least, you know, I hope so, because if it's not, then we are in a very sad state for the open source communities. So there you go. All right, that is it for the articles. Now we're coming to the smaller, tinier, awesome things that I have to highlight. Uh, starting with the first one. So there's this Captain Marvel website, uh, which is a promo for the upcoming Captain Marvel movie. If you haven't seen it, it's absolutely awesome. It's a throwback to the web of the 1995. This was about the time when I started going online, I guess. And um, I had a website like this as well at the time. Uh, it's very... <laughs> It is very similar visually, at least, to what we used to have in 1995. This this looks absolutely awesome. There's even the videos that you can play and, and even the carousel for the screenshots and everything. Now, the author here is not very happy with it because the, you see, while the website does look like the website from 1995, it does not behave like one. For example, it locks, uh, it loads the 10 megabytes of stuff in the background, which is in 1995, 28.8K um, modem was the fastest one available. I think I at the time had, oh, God damn it, that was a wrong button. I at the time, I started with, um, what was it? 4.6, no, wait, 4.8K, I think. So it was like very slow. And I remember you had to download the image overnight, basically, if you wanted to see anything. So yeah, that website would not load at all. And then there's uh, some additional things, like for example, they have the Easter egg um, for the, uh, um, yeah, so they have some JavaScript that basically wouldn't work in 1995, which I mean, okay, this is, you know, picking a bit too much, I guess. They have the dancing baby, which was the meme from 1996. There is some interesting pointers there, but it's, it's kind of, you know, um, I think the most mind blowing thing is that it actually is 10 megabytes and uh, trying to load it in 1995 just wouldn't work. <laughs> All right, continuing, we got what React hooks can do for you. A highlight on how the React hooks changed the uh, one React library. So there is this React i18 next library that is the internationalization library and they migrated from version nine to version 10 from using, well, essentially to use hooks API. And it is the same features it is 50% smaller. They reduced the size of the library from 21 kilobyte to just 11.4 kilobytes, just by using hooks, which is insane. And it still provides the same hooks, higher order components, render props, and SSR APIs, which is even more mind blowing. So if you are maintaining a React library, do make sure to look at the hooks because it might make your library way smaller. So this is absolutely awesome. There's also some interesting discussion in the comments. If you are curious, do check it out. Next thing we got here is promise.allsettled reaches stages two, which is a quite nice API for promises that I'm personally looking forward to. Now, the thing is that we have promise.all API, right? But uh, the problem with it is that it, as long as soon as one of the promises gets rejected, it all breaks, right? So you cannot await promises that are rejected. There's obviously workarounds around that, but um, it's like, it's, it's iffy, it's annoying and so on and so forth. So promises dot all settled essentially waits for all promises to fi finish disregarding whether they are rejected or resolved, which is kind of neat. And it's now stage two, which means we're gonna see it in the browsers probably by the end of the year, at least in Chrome and Firefox. Uh, so yeah, there you go. Next thing we got here is Google Docs API, finally. Finally, Google Docs introduces their API that you can use for task automation. So you can stop using hacky methods to work with documents and actually use a proper API for that now. That's basically all I have to say about that. Next thing we got here is what's the longest keyword sequence in JavaScript? So um, yeah, this is a bit insane. People are exercising and figuring out the longest keyword sequence that you can uh, write in JavaScript that would be considered valid. There is, uh, you know, the starting one is the 15 words, uh, it, you know, else to return yield delete true instance of type of void new class extends false in this while one. That is actually valid and that will actually compile. <laughs> but this is not the longest one. So if you're curious, do read this. There are some even crazier things down below. I won't show it now, but if you're just curious, do check it out. This is crazy. 
Next thing we got here is Bootstrap version 5 is finally getting rid of jQuery. No more jQuery in Bootstrap, which means it's going to be a valid option for React, for example, which is well overdue in my opinion. But there you go. Uh, for version 5, they're getting rid of jQuery and uh, I'm not honestly sure what's going to come out. It seems to be about 70% done, so they're still removing it from some components. But it's really awesome to see that they are actually moving that way. Next thing we got here is early demo of next uh, React dev tools. And there's a comment from uh, Brian Wan, who is the maintainer. Um, it is a web demo, which is also really cool. You can just you know open it in your browser and check it out. There is a lot of new things here and it's really cool. So if you're working with the React and using React dev tools quite frequently, make sure to check it out. It is pretty impressive. Another tweet from the same guy is, um, the DevTools rewrite that adding inspectable complex hooks values is just landed in DevTools rewrite and it looks absolutely fascinating. Look at this. You can just inspect hook and see, well, everything that is in that hook immediately in the sidebar, which, which is great. Like this is amazing work. So there you go. All right. Next thing we got here is another NPM related controversy. So if you are using Koa and Koa router package, make sure that you keep your eyes on this one because apparently core router package was sold to someone and is now transferred to a relatively unknown user on GitHub that, well, nobody knows what will happen to that essentially. It is downloaded 135K times per week. And so just, you know, be careful about that. There is a very long discussion about that in this thread. So make sure to read that if you're using this package or if you're interested in the whole uh, package ownership, there is again, you know, people complaining that MBM is broken. Well, this is actually not true, but yeah, it is, it is very like, I'm, I'm guessing we're going to see more and more of those kind of situations where people get burned out by maintaining packages and just either sell them off or do something else to them or just, you know, stop maintaining them, give them to other people. And we need some solution to that. And there is currently no good one, I guess. I mean, the current one is kind of works, right? Uh, but yeah, I guess validatable, um, what do you call it? Verifiable packages would be a nice start, but we'll see how that develops. Right, uh, now we are coming to the releases section and the first major release of the week is Next.js version point, uh, sorry, point, version eight, which brings a whole ton of awesome things, starting with the serverless Next. So now where you're compiling your Next uh, packages, you can actually at target serverless, which will result in each page compiling to a standalone package, which you can just deploy as a serverless binary, essentially, you know, rendering it with one tiny uh, server, which, you know, it can be HTTP, for example, in this case, it's just four lines of code, which is kind of awesome. And it creates like aims to create the smallest possible serverless function, typically around 50 kilobytes base zipped size, which is kind of cool. It also features the massive build time memory reduction, 16 times better. They've uh, they've also sent the improvement to the Webpack. So this is sort of a good thing for everyone who uses the Webpack, not just not, uh, Next.js guys. There's also now build time environment configuration available. So you no longer have to do any magical things uh, that are, you know, was a bit annoying. I mean, they work, but you know, it's way easier uh, this time around. So it's Kind of awesome to see this smaller initial size and a bunch of other improvements. So if you're using Next.js, make sure to update and check this out. As far as I noticed, there is no breaking changes there. So you should be, um, yeah, you should be fine with just updating. Next release we got here is Windows 95 version 2.0. I never thought I would say this words <laughs> on this stream especially, but there you go. So um, Windows 95 is the, uh, Electron that runs Windows 95 inside of it. And version 2.0 is a big upgrade for it that comes with sound, games, and networking, which is really impressive, to be honest. So yeah, if, if you want to run Windows 95 on your machine in Electron, <laughs> do check it out. It now seems to be pretty much full featured and you can run just about everyone, like everything in there. And yeah, you can, you can play Minesweeper in there without advertisement, by the way, that is integrated there in the Windows 10. So there you go. 
All right, next thing we got here is React Native version 0.59 release candidate one. Uh, maybe there's already a release candidate more. Uh, they had like one. Okay, so they only have two for now. But essentially, this is a release candidate for next version of React Native. The main thing uh, will be the React Hooks edition. So if everything goes well, we're going to see React Native 0.59 next week with the Hooks support which is awesome, which means you would be able to use outstated in there. Mm, yes, yes, this will work without any changes in React Native, which is absolutely awesome in my opinion. There we go. And the last release we got here is a Riot EM version 1.0. If you've never seen it, Riot is an open source chat platform that features end-to-end -end encryption and peer-to-peer -peer protocol essentially, which finally reached version 1.0. So you can install locally, you can use the one that they provide online, try it out and so on and so forth. It seems to be pretty cool. So uh, yeah, if you are looking for uh, self-hosted chats, then do check it out. It even has the mobile clients and everything. There you go. All right, that is it for the new uh, releases, right? This is what I want to say, new releases. And now we are going to the libraries and demos. The first library of the week we got here is React Hooks Easy Redux. So while the Redux is still in, you know, on the way to get the hooks, there is uh, supplementary packages that you can essentially use to get the Redux to use hooks just by instrumenting it essentially, which, you know, it looks pretty nice actually. So if you're using Redux and wanted to get in on the hooks, but don't want to wait for the official ones to land in Redux, then you can just take this. It's just 3.5 kilobytes min zipped, which is quite nice. Next thing we got here is Orca, Live Programming Environment. Now this thing is crazy. This allows you to program using letters. And um, yeah, there is even like, <laughs> this thing is insane. Just check it out for yourself, okay? There is even introduction video over here. I'll just mute it. You can write music using this thing. You can turn it into a sequencer. And it essentially just uses a field of letters. It is crazy. Just check it out. It's a mind blowing thing and you can do some insane stuff with it. Right. Next thing we got here is Vasm Roslin. Somebody compiled C Sharp to a WebAssembly and you can run and compile um, C Sharp code right in your browser. Come on. There we go. And you can run it and it actually works, which is also quite cool. And there is uh, GitHub code for it. For some reason, they don't have a GitHub link here, but it is on GitHub and you can just, you know, Go and check it out how it was done and try it out for yourself if you want to. Next thing we got here is instant.page. Make your side pages instant in one minute. So this is a very tiny JavaScript code uh, script. I mean, it's kind of open source, uh, doesn't have any license, unfortunately, like no mention of license at all, not hosted on GitHub for some reason. But nonetheless, this is a really cool snippet that makes your website preloads pages uh, very quickly. The idea is that essentially once you hover over something or touch start for the mobile devices, it will just add the um, preload link, uh, rel preload attribute to it. This results in a very, very fast page opening. So you just, you know, like the, the logic is that when you, the time between when you hover over link and click on it, it's typically quite big, like 300, 400, 500 milliseconds, depending on how quick you think, right? And during that time, after adding this preload attribute, your browser will actually preload everything and or majority of resources, and this will feel almost instantaneous. So by simply adding this tiny script to your page, uh, you will get a very, very impressive um, improvement in perceived loading times and perceived navigation. There was a demo somewhere, but I cannot find the link here. I don't think it's anywhere in here actually, uh, but yeah. Okay. It doesn't seem to be anywhere in here, but there was a link somewhere and, oh no, it is actually, okay. It is on GitHub. It's just not referenced from the main page. There you go. Okay. There you go. Okay. So yeah, you can even install it from NPM, which is great. And there is, MIT license. Okay, so it was just very cryptic. So it is on GitHub and you can actually use it with NPM, which is even better. It is it is great. Why would you not use that? So there you go. All right, next thing we got here is SWC, super fast JavaScript to JavaScript compiler written in Rust. So this is essentially Babel-like compiler that is written in Rust that allows you to take 
uh, JavaScript Next and compile it to the any other older version of JavaScript. Currently only supports some of the features, so it does not, uh, obviously is not as full featured as the Babel, but it is way faster than Babel, like way faster. So as you can see here, the performance test they did, uh, Babel was 65, about 66 ops per second, while SVC was about 1000 operations per second. So this is like way faster. Would be very interesting to see how that develops and really cool to see sort of native tooling uh, for JavaScript being developed. Like this is really, really fascinating. If that sounds interesting, make sure to start it and track the project. I probably should start myself until I forget about it. There you go. Next thing we got here is React Hooks Async, a portable asynchronous functional library for React Hooks. And exactly what it says. So it's essentially different uh, async hooks that allow you to do different things and also board them when needed. Um, yeah, I don't know. I personally don't really see any use for that as of yet, but maybe you do, so do check it out. Next thing we got here is Master, a universal data layer for components and services. Um, they do have some examples here and essentially allows you to wrap data or like objects into this master wrapper and then use ref thing to extract the data from it. I honestly couldn't figure out at least in you know 20 minutes of reading the docs, why would I need that? But maybe you do, so do check it out. Uh, hey Tim, will you do a podcast to cover the next version features? Um, but I mean, just read the article. I think it's basically the main feature there is the service rendering. Everything else is more or less like just performance improvement. So I don't, well, what, what do you want me to cover there? Okay, let's continue. Next thing we got here is Nextron, Electron plus Next.js boilerplate. So if you ever wanted to run your own app with Next.js inside of Electron, now you can just uh, fork this thing and do this. Seems to be quite nicely written with tests and everything. So there you go. Next thing we got here is Linaria, zero runtime CSS in JS, which looks pretty fascinating. Uh, and yeah, there you go. So it's it's essentially CSS and JS, but that has um, zero runtime overheads. I think this is not the first one to be there, but maybe you like this one more than everything else. So do check it out. Uh, you want to see me, no homo. <laughs> Sure, man. I mean, wherever you are in Leipzig or if I travel to wherever you are, I would be more than happy to grab a beer with you. Okay, continuing. We got reactexplorertech.org. This is an open source project to help developers learn, develop and explore. Essentially a collection of everything related to React split into nice categories like boilerplate, charts, components, data, developer, examples, forms, frameworks, integration, libraries, and so on and so forth. So if you ever wanted to look for React related things by categories, do check it out. Seems to be a quite hefty collection with quite a lot of things. And uh, yeah, there is a ton of things to find here. So there you go, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Shards Dashboard React, a free and beautiful React admin dashboard template. Looks very slick. Uh, Seems to be quite nice. I mean, there's like a bunch of components for just about everything you would want in dashboard. There's also a premium version if you want uh, more features, but yeah, you know, nothing super complex here. All right, next thing we got here is Open API, direct, uh, Open API Directory JS is what I wanted to say. This is a JavaScript library for working with Open API Directory, a thing that I did not know exists. Uh, so Open API Directory is a Wikipedia for web APIs and it has a REST API to find other APIs, which is absolutely awesome. And this is essentially a wrapper for Node.js. So if you are, you know, if you're working with that, do check it out. Seems to be quite cool. Next thing we got here is Admin Bro, the <laughs> thing with the silliest name ever, but it's an admin panel for apps written in Node.js. Seems to be sort of very flexible, very high configurable uh, admin panel with CRUD and custom things that you can add as plugins or whatever that you can use in your Node.js apps. Uh, seems to be um, okay. There's like a live demo and everything. So if you are looking for something like this, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Redactyl.js, a library with absolutely awesome name this time around that is redact sensitive information from JSON for logging. Essentially allows you to create a new instance of Redactyl, specify the properties that should be redacted. 
And then you can run it over your data and you will get the properties redacted. So, you know, sort of remove the sensitive information that you can then put into logs or export or whatever. Right, next thing we got here is Rotor, uh, next generation SIP server. So this seems to be a Node.js written SIP server. Um, I like, yeah, I, I never worked with the SIP protocol to be honest, so I don't really know what to tell you. But if you are looking for a SIP rotor and SIP server um, and you wanted to have it in Node.js, then I guess check it out. This seems to be quite nice. There's like pretty much everything in here. It's also a Gradle for some reason in the project, but uh, yeah, there you go. Right, next thing we got is Leon, uh, open source personal assistance written in, again, JavaScript. So if you are curious, or maybe you wanted your own customizable JavaScript assistant, do check it out, seems to be quite nice. There is also a demo available. There is a video, a tutorial and everything, basically whatever you want. Seems to be quite full featured actually. There is a lot of custom actions. Next thing we got is Motrix, a full featured download manager built on top of Electron using Vue, Vuex element and area two. So um, I, I like, I don't know if I would use that. I think Chrome downloader is perfectly fine for me at least, but maybe as a learning project that would work quite well because it does have quite a lot of features and oh, it even supports BitTorrent and Magnet, which is impressive to be honest. <laughs> there you go. Next thing we got here is DeskGap, alternative to Electron that allows you to build cross-platform desktop apps with web technologies. The idea is it also uses Node. Unfortunately, there is no Linux version for now, so the way it works, instead of bundling Chrome, it actually uses the VK Web View that works on macOS and Microsoft Toolkit forms UI control Web View on Windows. So it uses the platform specific API to render the um, whatever you do in there, right? Which means that you might have some problems with code compatibility, depending on the versions of operating systems that you deploy to users, right? So keep that in mind, but seems like a nice uh, starting point. Next thing we got here is deploy to kube, deploy your Node.js apps to Kubernetes with a single command, no config required. Essentially, seems pretty nice. Essentially, you know, just deploy to Kubernetes cluster with one command, um, straightforward and nice. If you want something simpler, do check out my project called Exoframe, not Travis. Why am I getting Travis? I want GitHub. So Kubernetes is nice and all, but it sometimes is an overkill and too hard. Uh, Exaframe allows you to do exactly the same one command deployments, but to Docker. So if you're curious, do check it out. Right, next thing we got here is Smoke, simple yet powerful file-based mock server with recording capabilities. The idea is very simple. You can start a server and then uh, request the any API and save it to JSON file, and then you will be able to query this um, API results as sort of path on local server, which seems quite handy actually. So if you are looking to mock APIs using JSON files, do check it out. Next thing we got here is Split.js, a two kilobyte unopinionated utility. Let me try that again. Two kilobyte unopinionated utility for resizable split views. Allows you to do things like this, you know, draggable split view that works pretty much anywhere, just two kilobytes. And there is even a nice React split wrapper. So do check it out. Next thing we got here is third party web summary of which third party scripts are most responsible for excessive JavaScript execution on the web. You, we should show this thing to the people who designed a manifest with three API saying that the ad blockers take too much time. So this thing compares different third party scripts and how much impact do they have on server <clears throat> apologies on the page loading. Starting from the ads, obviously, like the Google ads have actually way more impact on the page loading than the ad blocking extensions, as you might imagine. Uh, go into the analytics, go into the socials, video, uh, developer utilities, hosting platforms, marketing, customer success, content publishing, libraries, and so on and so forth. Um, the interesting thing is that if you take the analytics here, some of those analytics, can slow down your pages for as much as 870 milliseconds, which is insane. So there you go. If you're using any of those, make sure to reference this uh, thing to, you know, kind of track how much you can save by removing this or replacing them, or at least making them asynchronous. It is a very interesting to read. All right. Next thing we got here is, yes. So we are done with libraries and um, tools. 
Now we're coming to silly and interesting things. The first silly thing we, we got here is a Christmas year opinionated CSS formatter that formats your CSS as a Christmas tree. I think I need that for my JavaScript code now as well. <laughs> this looks absolutely stupid, but absolutely awesome. Somebody actually implemented it, yes. Okay, uh, next article we got here is audio AI, isolating vocals from stereo music using convolutional neural networks. This is not JavaScript article. This is article talking about how you can use convolutional neural networks to isolate the vocals and other track actually from the music uh, by using deep learning essentially. There is, uh, actually, let me just unblock my framing and everything. There is a ton of examples here and a ton of theory and a ton of basically convolutional neural networks and deep learning but it is absolutely fascinating to read and also really cool to see the results. Well, you know, they are far from perfect. They do work and do work really good. So you're curious, do check it out. And the last thing I got here is this tweet that actually um, outlines some uh, quite incredible things, to be honest. I never thought that HTML is 26 years old, CSS is 22 years old, and JavaScript is 23 years old now. So just, just think about it for a second. The another amusing thing is that JavaScript actually started developing very heavily just for the past, I don't know, five, six, 10 years, maybe less than 10, I guess, seven, eight years. And before that, it was just basically stagnating, which is, uh, yeah, quite impressive. But all right. That is all I got for you for today. This was BXJS Weekly episode 50. As usual, you can find all the links in the description in GitHub. Uh, feel free to join our Discord server to discuss any of that or ask for help in JavaScript. This is basically all I got for you for today. Thank you very much for watching. Thank you for your support as always. Have a great weekend or great rest of the week if you're watching this during the week. Um, yeah, I guess that's basically it. Thanks, guys, and I see you next time. Bye.